Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome Ann Tompkins today to, uh, as our speaker. She is a uh, partner in the law firm of, uh, well, in the Charlotte and Washington, D.C. offices of the law firm of Cadwallader, Wickersham, and Taft. What great names. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chuck did a great job of introducing Ann in the bulletin and in his uh, weekly email message, but I needed to add that I had never heard of Ann Tompkins until 2004 when there was an article in the Charlotte Observer about a young woman who was an assistant U.S. attorney in Charlotte who was being sent to Baghdad to help uh, with the investigations by the Iraqi Special Tribunal that was investigating uh, the, the crimes of, of uh, Saddam Hussein and his regime. And I thought, wow, isn't that awesome? And I thought, wow, that's scary. <laughs> but uh, I was so delighted to have a chance to meet with her when she became the United States Attorney, <coughs> not meet with her, to meet her, uh, and to, to get to know her a little bit because uh, she has a, a great background. Uh, she's been, she served as an assistant uh, uh, district attorney, assistant U.S. attorney. She has been the, for five years, the federal prosecutor in the Western District as the United States um, attorney uh, in the 31 counties in the western part of North Carolina. So uh, we're delighted that she's here. She's now working for this private law firm. She is not on our, you know, we're not funding her tax uh, supported salary anymore, so I'm <laughs> very grateful that she is giving up billable hours to be here to speak to us today. So, welcome. Thank you. Billable hours. And I'm expensive. <laughs> Free to you. <laughs> Let me get rid of that. So, thank you guys really for having me. This is, this is a part of my life as U.S. Attorney that I miss, and that is coming out and meeting people in communities. So I was really happy to get the invitation and absolutely ecstatic to come out and see you guys and see some, some old friends uh, and new friends. So thanks for having me. So in my five years as U.S. Attorney, there were, Barbara and I talked about what I could, what I could talk about here, and there were a lot of cases that we did, but the more we talked about it, the more we thought you know, one of the most unique things that happened in my life and really happened in the history of, of our lives um, was the fall of, of the Saddam Hussein regime and just the fact that I got a, uh, an opportunity, um, didn't feel like an opportunity at some points in it, but uh, to, to be part of that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. And I took, um, I took hundreds and hundreds of pictures, which I've brought to you today. <laughs> um, I brought 30 of them or so today. But it, this, this was actually 2004, 2005 was back in the day when you actually had to have a camera, and, um, you know, as opposed to now where uh, it would seem much easier. Uh, and in a couple of the pictures, I actually have a camera in my hand. Some other folks took pictures. So here's how this went down. Bob Conrad, if anybody knows, uh, Judge, now Judge Conrad was the U.S. Attorney back in 2004. He was in Washington and meeting with the Deputy Attorney General, and, and this was at a time, a moment in time, I always like to say this, when things looked like they were going and going to be going well in Iraq. It was a, a month or so, it feels like, when things were looking good. So Judge Conrad came back to the office and said, hey, they're putting together a team of lawyers to go to Iraq and help this tribunal that they're putting together investigate the case against Saddam Hussein and members of the regime. So at the time, we started thinking, you know, who could we send, you know, sort of to get rid of someone <laughs> in the office. And the more we talked about it, the more I said, you know what, that sounds like a, an amazing opportunity. Um, I think I'm interested. And so that was January of 2004. And so by June of 2004, I was headed to D.C. Um, I spent uh, two months in D.C being the liaison I worked at the FBI, worked with an FBI agent. We made basically cold calls to the CIA, um, which is a whole different story, um, and to the Department of Defense to find out what we, what we already knew. What we didn't know at that time was when we were putting together a trial uh, to help the Iraqis put together a trial, would there be people in Iraq who would be willing to testify against members of the former regime? You just never know, will people raise their hands, will people say, it's too dangerous, I'm not interested. So part of it was, let's identify people living in the United States who have fled Iraq 
but had interesting um, stories to tell about what happened. So we did that um, here. Then in August, I headed to, to Baghdad, and I'm going to talk to you about that. So if you can see that, I wonder if we can turn the light out up here, maybe, if that's possible. Um, but the, so, so 2004, um, there was still, uh, the, it, was, it was a war zone still. And so that, that's actually the, the airport in Baghdad at the time. So as you can see, there really, it really wasn't an airport. It was, um, it was just razor wire and C-130 transport planes. So I flew into Kuwait and then took a C-140 into, into Baghdad. And that was, that's the way that um, transportation was done. Um, and so that was my first, first foray. There, I went to a place called Camp Slayer, which was up near the airport, which was the camp where the Iraq survey group was situated, which was the group who was looking for weapons of mass destruction, if you remember that whole um, part of, of our time in Iraq. And so they had, th this is where basically the, the classified information was. Since what we were doing, we were trying to uh, find documentary evidence and witnesses to various crimes against humanity um, and war crimes that had happened under the Saddam Hussein regime. I will note at this moment that before I decided to go to Iraq, I knew absolutely nothing about crimes against humanity. You'll be happy to know. Um, but what I, said to the, what I said to the person who was putting this team together was, um, I don't know about crimes against humanity, but I can, I can figure that out. What I, what I can do is, um, I'm, I'm sort of wash and wear, I'm, an, I'm not a complainer, um, and, I'm, and I'm a hard worker. And so if, those, if, that's your, if that's part of the criteria, which ended up being, um, he said, that's, that sounds good to me. So I learned about crimes against humanity and war crimes, and, I, and my skills as being not a complainer, wash and wear, um, and, and sort of an um, easy person to be around, ended up coming in much handier than my legal knowledge. So this was a place um, that where the Iraq survey group um, was situated, and we glommed on to what they were doing. They were, they were looking at documents that had been gotten from the regime as it fell, looking for evidence that there was a weapons of mass destruction program. So we said, while you're looking, um, can you also look for, and we, we gave them this uh, a list of, of other issues, the crimes against the Kurds being at the top of our list. Um, back in the, in the 80s, there was a, uh, a chemical attack against uh, the Kurdish people, and I'll get more into that. So we got them to agree to that. So that was, that was actually my office. And it looks, everything looks really good from the outside. I will say that fine Iraqi craftsmanship um, was not, uh, not really the, the way things really looked. In, I mean, every, every step was a different size, and so I mean, you were tripping up and downstairs all the time. But everything looked really, really good from the outside, like that. So that's, that is from the, uh, a balcony off of, off of that building. The, um, the building out in the middle was bombed out, so of course that looks very cool. No one would touch the water um, because we didn't know what was in it. Um, and a, a lot of those buildings were actually bombed. We lived, I'll show you where we lived. We lived in trailers, and these were the, um, these were trailers that were for uh, the, uh, the senior executive service people and uh, leaders in the in the military so that was these were really really good digs inside of this I, I don't have a picture of it but it was about six by eight it was a single bed and, and there was enough room to get out of the bed uh, but you know what did I need I didn't need much more than that and those were actual date palms where they had you know we, we got we could we could actually eat, eat dates so I spent a little bit of time at Camp Slayer um, working with working with military and working with the intelligence community up there. The rest of my team, and by team I mean when, the, when, when Judge Conrad said, hey, they're putting together a team, I was envisioning you know, 30 or 40 lawyers, and so was he. It ended up being four of us. Uh, three guys named Greg and me. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a little, so I was thinking, oh, I can blend, you know, I can blend into a 30 or 40 person. So it ended up being the, the Greg. So I, we went by last names, or I did with them, Kehoe, Nibola, and Paul. Um, were, were my three Greg um, compadres. And so this was the embassy in Baghdad, which was strategically not bombed, 
it was our embassy, it was, the, it was the presidential palace. And again, it looks really cool from the outside. On the inside, not so cool. The toilets didn't flush for one thing, and the entire time I was there, the toilets didn't flush, a little factoid, water didn't run. That was not just true for us, it was true for everyone in Baghdad, which was, um, which was part of the difficulty of helping them get to a better place. And as you can see, it was a military environment. There's a, an army guy, and there's uh, the, the sandbags there, um, which, were, which were everywhere. So I got there about August. Th this just gives you a, a sense of scale. My father's a retired architect, and whenever I would take pictures, he would always want there to be something that would give scale. And it, so there's a trash can at the bottom. So you can see this is an enormous building. It was actually one mile from one, one end to the other. Wow. And, so, and that eagle was the symbol, was, was Saddam Hussein's um, sort of official symbol. See, this is my Club Med picture. Um, another picture that makes it look like it was really great. Um, doesn't that look like Club Med? <laughs> Club Med Baghdad. So we would sit out there. Um, I don't smoke, but, but my, my colleagues would smoke Cuban cigars. Um, and uh, we would pretend we were in Club Med until there would be an explosion or um, a sandstorm, which is my favorite. And, and I called them dirt storms because it wasn't really, sandstorm has kind of a sex appeal to it that a dirt storm doesn't. But when you're, <laughs> when you're sitting outside and all of a sudden it gets kind of foggy in your mouth, you're like, is that dirt? <laughs> you know, eating dirt. And so there would be these, these dirt storms that would come in. But we would sit out there and, and try to relax. And, and literally, my going away party months later, um, you can't really see it up in the corner, but there was like a little pavilion up there. We got bombed during my um, mortar, during my, uh, my going away party. And I have a scar on my knee as I sort of flipped off of the, of the pavilion to, to get lower. Um, but, uh, but that's, you know, that was sort of the, the tempo of the day. But we did try to find these kind of moments um, in our world to, you know, to make it bearable. So this is where, this was the, I, I lived on row 54J, um, and so this is how it was. I, I lived on the grounds of the embassy, and everybody did. It was sort of the, one of the, one of the cool things about this world is that it was totally equal. Nobody had it better than anybody else. Everybody lived in a trailer. Everybody lived in a trailer that was surrounded by sandbags. No one was immune from that, so there, that sort of common ground I think made it made it a, uh, an interesting environment. So my my uh, uh, my trailer up here was was to the left. There. It was actually like 54 JL. You know, I can't remember my exact address, but you get to you get to sort of figure out where you live. But this is how everybody lived, um, and the sandbags were there. Well, before I get to that, there's a this is a bunker. Um, that these were everywhere. About every 20 feet or so, there would be a, a concrete bunker. Um, and so, and you can see behind it are, are concrete walls. They were also everywhere, blast walls. And so you, you got this kind of a rhythm of, of looking like where's the next bunker, where's the next bunker as you, as you just walked along. It would be a beautiful day and you'd be walking along but your eyes would be going to where's my, where's my next shelter and that's why. Um, and because we, we got mortared, which was one of the, I guess it was, I was a little surprised somehow when I got there. They didn't tell me that. Um, in that moment in time when I said, hey, I think that sounds like a really cool idea. Um, it seems like we were headed into the peace um, direction. And, and when I got there, we, we headed back into the war direction. And so it was too late. Um, I was already there. And I couldn't. Couldn't pull out, but uh, so so one of the things that you I can't say you got used to it because I never got used to the sound of something exploding nearby, um, but uh, but it was something that happened, and what you began to realize is, and this is crazy, but you begin to realize if anybody here has been in a war zone, odds are, um, you know, the odds are with me. If if I'm going to die, it's just the odds are. Uh, that this thing is gonna land someplace and it's not gonna land on or near me. And that's how, sort of how we lived, which is, which is very bizarre um, looking back on it, but it seemed logical. To me. <laughs> so we would literally, we would sometimes be, a lot of times the mortars would come in very early in the morning, like four o'clock in the morning. It was a, so the sound of morning prayers to me began to signify uh, a mortar attack. Which is, uh, which is, so, so I have this uh, auditory memory whenever I hear the call to prayer. 
I was waiting for an explosion. But that's that was sort of the rhythm of it. This one was in, was during the day. The other crazy stuff that you begin to learn is you begin to learn uh, the distance. Um, when I very first night I was I was at Camp Slayer, there I heard explosions and I was wrecked. I mean, I got up the next morning and I was like, oh my God, that was horrible. People looked at me and said, what? And it, I didn't realize that it was so far away that everybody, all my colleagues who had been there for a while, had were able to assimilate. Um, that was long, that was far away. No need to worry. And of course, I was up all night listening to explosions. So you get to know what to worry about, and what not to worry about. You also get to know things like that's a rocket, not not a mortar. A rocket has its own fuel source. So when it explodes, it burns. A mortar uh, is is just propelled, and when it lands. Its, its lethality is based on it exploding and, and shrapnel coming out. So those are just little factoids that you thought you could get through your whole life not knowing. <laughs> um, but there you go. So the, one of the symbols of Iraq and of Saddam was the cross swords, um, and which was in the green zone. The green zone was a four square mile place inside Baghdad where the presidential uh, palace and, and other uh, government buildings were, which the United States took over. Um, when we took over the country. And the cross swords and that, and that parade ground was right there. So we, we could go over there if we wanted to, as you can see it was kind of mess, messy. Um, but you could actually go up into the, the, the you could go up into the hand, um, uh, somewhat like, but not very much like, the Statue of Liberty hand, which I, which I remarked when I went up there. I was like, hey, this is kind of like Statue of Liberty. <laughs> not really. <laughs> but that was in the that was in the green zone. So after I was there, I got there in August, and by October there had been um, coordinated attacks inside the green zone, and so the green zone became it became just more and more unsafe um, for us to travel, um, and and so they basically closed off. We we had armored vehicles. Our group was called the Regime Crimes Liaison Office (RCLO). And, and so we had an office in the embassy and, and a, sort of a seat at the table um, with the ambassador and, and other um, organizations that were there. So, so by October, we could no longer drive ourselves anywhere um, or drive in, on the road between the airport, which is where Camp Slayer was, and the, and the green zone. It was a four mile stretch of road that became too, too uh, dangerous. So we traveled, which was happy, happy for me, we got to travel by Black Hawk helicopter. <laughs> so that, was, that suited me just fine. The problem was is that we, did, we weren't the military, and we didn't have any military orders. That's where the I'm easy to get along with part came in, because I had a lot of friends. I meet friends in elevators, so, um, so this was helpful. I met a lot of people eating, everything was communal, so I'd sit down and meet people, and, and those relationships became really important. We had, to, we had to travel by space available, so I would go down to the transportation office, the, uh, and say, here's where we need to go, and here's the number of people that need to go. Are you guys going there anytime soon? Because we'd like to hop a ride. And so that's how we traveled. And we, so we did it by Black Hawk, as you can see, those are the real guys behind me. But we were, at this point, um, I think heading off to do um, a mass grave reconnaissance trip, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I liked it, I liked traveling by, by Black Hawk. Who wouldn't? The helmet and flak vest that I wore, the flak vest weighed 34 <coughs> pounds. And I say that because there's a lot of, you know, like a, uh, law enforcement that are really light, lycra kind of things, and that was not what this was. They were really thick ceramic plates, front and back. The helmet was really heavy. It was like eight pounds, which um, I got like a neck muscles, like a wrestler. <laughs> it, was, it was really, I mean, it was... I mean, it was really difficult to, to sort of wear that stuff. I had a gun before, when I was at the FBI in Washington, this was a very cool thing. Um, in the basement of the Hoover building is a uh, range, which is not used anymore. But they cleared out a couple of lanes for me and, I, and, and taught me how to shoot in the basement of the Hoover building, a firearms instructor at the FBI. So I qualified and carried a nine millimeter. So it was, it was not that big of a deal. I knew that a 9mm firearm was going to get me nowhere. Um, if something went bad, um, that I like to leave it to the experts. But I used to carry the, uh, the 9 on my flak vest as a way to signify to the bad guys, don't kidnap me. 
Um, I have a gun. And, and, and so that I looked like a hard target. I had no intention of using the gun, but I wanted to appear that I would have lots of intention of using the gun. So I carried the gun not, not really offensively, but defensively. And eventually, I, when I started traveling by Humvee, if you had a gun, you were given a sector in the pre-trip briefing, like they would say, Anne, you've got three o'clock to six o'clock. I didn't want three o'clock to six o'clock. Um, I wanted to be the package, which they called the non-armed person. So I stopped carrying my firearm so I could be the package. I wanted someone to just whisk me out of harm's way rather than be responsible. I think lawyers with guns are a bad idea, generally speaking. <laughs> So one of, the, um, one of the crimes that we investigated, we learned about from the Iraqis, and, and I keep track of time here, um, it was the, they called it the al Dajjal crime, and that's really, that's the case that Saddam Hussein was tried for. <laughs> Briefly, we, didn't, we had never heard of it, but it was an infinite, infamous crime inside Iraq to the, to the tribunal judges. And Saddam Hussein had driven through this town, al Dajjal, in the center of the, of the, of the country. And there had been a small attack on his convoy, an unsuccessful um, attack on his life. So in retribution, uh, Hussein had his brother, who was the head of the secret police, uh, arrest all of the fighting edge aged men in the town. And they were tried overnight. This was all in a 24 hour period. They were tried, they were found guilty, and they were executed. It was over 300 people. Not, not, that wasn't enough. He moved out all the uh, women and uh, elderly and children, put them into an internment camp, and that wasn't enough. They sowed salt into the soil of this town, which had been a fruit grove. So that was the so that that's what happened. So the and the people in that town had been resettled to a basically an internment camp for five years, um, imprisoned basically for five years for this. So, which is a crime against humanity under international law. So the inside Iraq, this was a big deal. So we went to Dajjal. Um, I, I met a person at dinner who knew somebody, it's one of those kind of things, who knew somebody, who knew somebody. Turns out that the captain, the army camp captain, who was the head of that sector, was a um, Manhattan assistant DA who had, in his spare time, interviewed uh, dozens of townspeople about what had happened. So when we showed up and met him, he's, he had boxes of files of witness interviews already done, um, which, was, which was pretty miraculous. Ahmed was my translator. One of the other add-ons to this is of the complexity of operating in a place like this is all the documents, of course, were in Arabic, and all the speakers were either speaking Kurdish or Arabic. So things moved very slowly. Ahmed was my guy and traveled with me um, everywhere. And that was a trip that we went to to Dajjal in my Kate Spade bag, right there at my side, <laughs> is a, the document there is a, an aerial um, of, the, of the area uh, that the, we got from the military that showed those sections that were dirt, and they were dirt because of the salt that was sown into the soil. So this is, this is in Dajjal, and I put that in there because here I am yucking it up with, with the Greggs. There's me down here in the corner with my camera in my hand. <clears throat> and the military guys are keeping us safe. And so I have deep, deep respect for my military buddies who helped us. We couldn't have done anything that we did. We couldn't have gone anywhere. We couldn't have done anything. We couldn't have stood in the middle of that street without those guys helping us. So at every step, um, they were great partners for us, even though we did not have military orders. We just added on to what they were doing and they were they were fantastic. Here's another um, one of the one of the tasks that I was given by Greg was to go and so my my thing was and go recon a potential mass grave site in Muthana. And so then she would go away. So I had to not knowing I had to know where, where is that? How do I get there? Who sort of owns that part of the country? Um, what we wanted to do was make sure that we wanted to we wanted to exhume a mass grave for evidentiary purposes. We wanted to make sure that the citizens around that area had not gone, as they had in a lot of other places in Iraq, and sort of dug up um, suspected mass grave sites because people's family members were <coughs> stolen away and never to be heard from again. And the hope was 
of so many people is that when Saddam Hussein was toppled, that those that the that the doors of the prisons would be open and their loved ones would come home, which sadly was not the case because they had they were not imprisoned. Um, so in the middle, if you can see, is me. <laughs> surrounding me are the scruffy guys are Blackwater. The unscruffy guys are the Dutch military who owned that sector. They were they were in that sector at the time. So all the good looking ones are the Dutch guys, um, and the bearded guys are Blackwater. But the, the, these were so they were taking me out to the mass grave site um, so that we could see if it was eligible and, and ready to be um, exhumed, and, and for me to figure out how are we going to stay safe while we exhume the mass grave. This was another. We did two mass graves. Um, the, the one that were in the previous slide, and this was in one in an area called Hatra. Um, uh, out, as you can see, this is what you see when you walk out there. If you turned around in a 360, that's what it looks like. A local had spoken to a Marine um, when the Marines first went in and said, I was a backhoe operator and I dug trenches. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know any more than that, but I know that I dug trenches out in the middle of nowhere and I'll show you where I did. And so this was based on that intel that we went out to this area. Army Corps of Engineers um, and a group of archaeologists from St. Louis um, headed, headed this part of the team. Amazingly enough, the, the crimes, and, and this isn't going to be too, I mean it's serious stuff, but it, hopefully it's not going to be, it won't be too bad. But on the ground, um, were artifacts, as, as we in the um, call them, but, but these are from, these are crimes that happened in the late 80s, but the, just the weather and, um, and you know, the way that, that there's, everything was untouched out there. These were, we suspected, artifacts from back in those days. So the Army Corps of Engineers put a team out, um, and we began, based on the intel from the local backhoe operator, to exhume based where, where he said here, here, and here. These, this, the marks down here were not from our, our digger, but they were actually um, from decades ago, from the 80s. The, the soil, I guess, out there is like talcum powder, and you, you, can, you can step in it and you can sink down to your knees, and when it compresses, it compresses like concrete. And so from a, an evidentiary or archeological point of view, it, it, it made that grave into sort of a concrete encased grave. So again, I don't want to be callous, but we're looking at it from a, we're getting evidence for a crime. So this was a crime scene, um, and so that was the, so our goal was what can we find out? Who are these people and how did they get there? So we did this like it was a American crime scene, and we said to the Iraqis, there's due process, and we have to make sure that we get this evidence in a way that, the, that, that not just Iraqis will believe it to be true, but that the world will. So when you put these cases on, we want, we want this to be done in a really methodical way. So we, we plotted everything, everything was photographed and marked as evidence as we went. There were two graves that we exhumed. One, this one, which we called the men's grave, which we didn't end up doing anything with. What we were looking was for weapons, was for um, was for crimes against humanity. So we wanted to focus on uh, not men, but on women and children. There would have been a defense for uh, if you were a an insurgent then the defense of Saddam Hussein and the regime would be they were fighting the government and we have a right to fight against insurgents. So we were looking for evidence that, would, that was going to be clearer and so there would be no reason for the regime to, to be killing women and children. So this was all men. So we, you know, for purposes of figuring out who they were, we did that, but not for evidentiary purposes. There was another grave that was, that was tragically women and children and that, that is here. It was methodically over the course of months exhumed by a group of, of archaeologists. And if you, you can look as closely as you wish, but they're, um, that's, it looks like a jumbled uh, bunch of clothing, um, and, and it is, uh, but it's, it's also uh, remains. From a, we didn't know going in what would happen. What happened was we found in the clothing, um, we found identification cards. <coughs> And that's what they looked like when we, when we got them out. And so we cleaned them up. Um, we actually sent them to St. Louis to have them um, cleaned 
so that we can look at them. You can see you know, a, a picture of a child. Um, and we got nine of these. There's another one, another picture of a child. And you could see uh, we had them translated so we could figure out who are these people. Um, and it, up in the corner, you can see Bingard. Um And that's a very small little town in Kurdistan. So we took this evidence um, that we got from these cards and we, we had a Kurdish translator as well. Um, and he helped us and sort of did the, <laughs> went, went up and, and found who these people were, where they came from. And we went there. So we followed the evidence um, to Kurdistan. Kurdistan is in northern Iraq. It's on the Iraqi, I mean, on the Iranian border. So I, as you can see, absolutely beautiful. The, you couldn't really get off road because Saddam Hussein had sown the fields with uh, bombs, and so there were all of these signs, basically with these, you know, red, you know, X's like don't, don't walk here, because otherwise I said we shouldn't have like an X Games here or something. <laughs> but like, other than the fact that you, you might get blown up, so we went to this little town where these people um, for the ID cards came from, and so you can see the other part from an evidentiary point of view is there's no strategic advantage that the regime could have had to take this. As you can see, this little, this is what it looked like. If you, we went off road riding up in, you know, a stream to get there. This was not like right <laughs> off the road. This was four wheeling um, for an hour to get up into this hill. So you, if you stood in the middle, there was a river that went through it or a stream. And you turned around and, and looked at the other side, it was exactly the same. So it was just this. And this is where uh, these people came from. So no strategic advantage so from an evidentiary point of view. This was this was us putting helping to put this case together. So this is what this is what it looked like. Lots of kids there, which was very uh, bittersweet for us. It was beautiful to see the kids, but the clothing that they had on, and obviously it was it was harkened back to um, you know what we had experienced um, at the mass grave. The, and this is just me with the, some of the some of the guys who lived there. We. Amazingly enough, three of the uh, ID cards, so we obviously had to ask these people, who are, who are these people? Um, so for some of them, they didn't, they had no idea what had happened to their mother um, or, their, uh, or their siblings. The man that's sitting there with the, um, with the mustache, his ID card was among the nine ID cards that we, that we had, and so were his two sisters. When the, uh, so we've learned from him that on that day, Helicopters had come in, sort of gunship helicopters, and and fired on that little t that little area. You can't call it a town. The m mother had sent her three children run to the hills, and she was captured. So when we got her ID, her remains, her children's ID cards were with her. So we thought they had been killed, but um, there they were. So, and that's the, that's the, uh, that's the son, and of course they said 20 years had, had gone past. And again, they, didn't, they hadn't known what had happened, so it was really, I cannot tell you how emotional it was um, to have these conversations with these people. It was just amazing. The guy sitting next to me, Cameron, was our Kurdish translator. So we sat and we talked to these people about what happened. Um, this is Judge Rod, who was the very courageous head of the Iraqi tribunal. We had a lot of a hard time getting judges to agree to be on the tribunal or to be a face of the tribunal. One of the judges that we were working with was murdered um, while we were there. There were because they were working with the Americans, and I mean it was just a really tense environment. But Judge Rod was very courageous to say, um, "Someone's got to step up and do it." He lived in the Green Zone, uh, ate dinner with his family many times, um, and we were hopeful about Iraq because of people like Judge Rod. Unfortunately, fortunately for Judge Rod, unfortunately for Iraq, he now lives in Austin, Texas, um, and, and he had three little boys, and, he, and, and ultimately, I'm still in touch with him, and ultimately he said, I can't, I can't raise my children in this environment. So. Um, so he came to America, and I'm thankful for him and for his children. But it's unfortunate for the um, for the country that people like Judge Rod are fleeing and have fled. So that's um, a very cool picture of 
Saddam Hussein. I got to see Saddam Hussein in uh, an initial appearance um, that uh, when he was arrested and, and uh, again we, we were trying to impress upon the Iraqis to, they were very anxious to get to the end. He's guilty, why are we doing all this? Um, and so we were trying to say <coughs> this, this is partly for you, it's partly for the world. So let's, let's walk through this. Let's give him protections and, uh, and legal protections that he didn't give you. Um, and so we went through that whole process of assigning him a lawyer and explaining the charges against him and, and the trial. I, was, I left before the trial went on. And, and one thing that I was disappointed, um, there, there is an appeal process. The Iraqi uh, justice system is, is hundreds of years old. It's based on the, the French civil system. So there was nothing um, old-fashioned or Middle Eastern about it. It was a very sophisticated legal system, which includes appeals. Unfortunately, as soon as we handed over Saddam Hussein to the Iraqis, they ex executed him that day. Um, and we were hoping, you know, for an appeal process. And but um, it, it's hard to put yourself in their shoes uh, and the feelings that they wanted to have of, of retribution and um, and rough justice. So. Um, that, I know we have a tight schedule, so I want to keep an eye on it. And if anybody's got questions, I'm happy to answer. So thank you. Thank you, Ann, for a really wonderful program. I hope you stay behind for a few minutes. I will. If you have any questions, people might have comments. We'll go ahead and turn our lights back up. And a special thanks to our, our special guests that came with us today. And with that, let's rise and be adjourned with our four-way test.